Hello folks, this is the first YouTube lecture to accompany chapter seven in the Kovac and Flory dedicated to psychedelia. Uh, a few uh, warnings about this uh, content. Uh, we've already addressed uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll in a lot of different ways, uh, but this chapter will particularly feature an exploration of psychedelic drug use and its association with the rock and roll experience uh, as that was encountered in the mid to late 1960s. Uh, so uh, just, a, uh, just a warning and an acknowledgement, uh, we are not condoning the use of illegal drugs. Uh, however, that was a prominent part of the culture um, among uh, rock and roll fans and musicians, um, not just then, but especially in the late 1960s in the style of music we've come to know as psychedelia. Uh, this chapter is going to explore what the musical characteristics and the cultural associations uh, were with this uh, distinctive time in music history. Uh, so there are a couple things I'd like to have up. First of all is the chapter 7 PowerPoint uh, that's available to you in Blackboard. Uh, also, uh, I included uh, the Music Bird uh, website, which has a host of other uh, YouTube videos that I've collected to facilitate this instruction, which will also be referred to from time to time um, as I go through these slides. So uh, jumping into the PowerPoints on uh, slide two, uh, you may have heard of the phrase Summer of Love. Uh, that was originally coined around 1967. Uh, to refer to a distinct change in American culture uh, that went towards what we um, what Kovac often calls uh, the hippie aesthetic, um, shifting away from status quo uh, uh, thinking and getting into uh, sparked by several things, sparked by uh, a growing concern over the American involvement in the Vietnam conflict, uh, which is going to divide uh, America and. Uh, lead to questioning authority even more, questioning the government more than has traditionally been done in our country's history. Um, but also, uh, there is going to be an increase in the number of uh, psychedelic drugs that are available to people, and not in the, in the early context of the use of LSD uh, or other hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, these were actually facilitated and um, uh, utilized in a lot of psychological studies, uh, for a time in the 50s and early 60s, LSD was actually uh, uh, considered a medical treatment uh, by psychiatrists. Uh, it eventually is going to be uh, promoted uh, by folks such as Timothy Leary, uh, the Ken Kesey acid tests, uh, but uh, often people look towards Aldous Huxley's 1954 book, The Doors of Perception, as uh, a, a, a beatnik area uh, book that um, questions authority, but also specifically gets at the idea of uh, looking at the world in new and different ways and how drugs can be a way to facilitate that new perspective. Um, that book, Doors of Perception, is going to inspire the work of people like Ken Kesey or Timothy Leary. Uh, it's going to encourage and uh, lead to people exploring the, the role of these psychedelic drugs. And that is going to be closely tied to the rise of musicians and artists who are looking for ways to enhance this trip that they are on. Uh, and uh, Kovac, I think, does a careful job of clarifying that when we refer to a trip uh, that you would be on, uh, this could be either a drug-induced trip that you're taking, or it could be a uh, fully conscious and sober trip that you're taking. Uh, but the word trip is going to get used interchangeably, Whether, but it's, it's not just a, a drug-induced uh, state of consciousness. It could be a state of higher consciousness that is achieved through other means. Um, but definitely the idea of getting to a state of higher consciousness is going to be uh, a big goal in the psychedelic era, and music is going to be an important part of how we achieve that higher consciousness and other substances uh, were definitely explored at that time too. Uh, moving on though to uh, slide four. Um, among the other factors that are affecting these changes in American society in the 1960s is an increased attention not just on drug use or new types of music, but also um, on exploring spirituality from other cultures, especially cultures outside of uh, Western culture. Um, 
perhaps most prominently is uh, Indian music, but also Indian spirituality. Uh, and that's going to start to uh, blend into a lot of the pop culture and the pop music of, of, of Americans and Western culture at this time. Um, most notably, you'll probably be aware that the Beatles, as they get out of their early phase and into their studio late phase, uh, they are going to begin experimenting more with studio uh, creation in music. Um, but they're also going to, as they pull away from the public to find more privacy, uh, to find um, a place where they are not harassed by so many fans and they can no longer do their big concerts, um, they are going to start exploring places that are focused on, frankly, inner peace. And uh, they're going to uh, travel to India. They, they will study with uh, not only how to play Indian music, uh, but they'll also uh, study with Indian gurus and start to adopt some of that Indian uh, philosophy, uh, Hindu philosophy, into their, their writing and into their music. So that is going to introduce Indian sounds. The sitar features prominently in several late Beatles records. Um, but another huge Indian influence in uh, American culture was at the uh, 1967 Monterey Pop Festival. Uh, this was traditionally a uh, music festival that would feature uh, rock bands, uh, Jefferson Starship, or Jefferson Airplane at that time, would have been playing, and Janis Joplin. I mean, it, it would have been a place to hear the top rock groups and artists of the day. Um, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan, all of these names we've been studying, they would, they would have been at events like the Monterey Pop Festival. And uh, in 1967, uh, the Pop Festival, which included many of these artists, it also brought in uh, an eclectic, different sound. It brought in Ravi Shankar. And Ravi Shankar is a traditional Indian music uh, musician uh, who specializes on the sitar. He brought in his, uh, his entourage of musicians who play things like the tabla, which is the, uh, a pitch drum that can adjust its pitch based on how you press into the head. Uh, gets a really cool doom, doom kind of a sound. Um, but it's so curious, and this is one of the videos I would like you to check out on the Music Bird site, is uh, go and check out uh, the clip I have of Ravi Shankar at the Monterey Pop Festival. And uh, there's, there's two interesting things, at least, uh, when you watch this video. Uh, first of all, it's a great just representation of what normal life would have been like in 1967. You're going to see the hippie aesthetic. Uh, you're going to see uh, what uh, what it looked like to, to be at one of these pop festivals with the, the artists and the vendors and the, the, the colorful hippie clothing throughout um, the, uh, the, uh, the arena or the, um, the field where everyone was listening at the stages. Um, you, you'll see a lot of drug use. Um, but you're also going to see a performer who doesn't fit into the grand scheme of the other styles that are associated with this performance. There are even cutaway clips to people like Grace Slick or uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, so they were being affected by Shankar's performance as well. But what Shankar uh, famously gets up and does at the beginning of his set is he looks out to this crowd of hippies that have been rocking out to the hard, you know, rock and roll. And uh, he says, I would like you to put away your substances. I would like you to listen in quiet reflection to the music that we are going to share with you right now. And remarkably, um, the audience for the most part does that. And they, they settle down, they listen. And uh, that performance by Shankar in 67 just uh, really kind of exploded throughout uh, the music world. And it's going to be one of the other big touchstones as to how did Indian music become a part of American pop culture? Uh, and the Beatles and this performance of the Monterey Pop Festival are cited as two big uh, important influences. Uh, Ravi Shankar, side note, also uh, has a very famous daughter that you may have heard of. Uh, Nora Jones uh, is his daughter. He didn't raise her, but uh, he is. he has a a lot of connections into the music world that you may be aware of. That's it I think I'll do for right now in part one, uh, but when we come back in part two, we're going to start looking at examples of psychedelia in two of the most famous bands of the 1960s as they evolved from their early stages into their later stages where they focused more on 
studio recording. We're talking about the Beach Boys and the Beatles. <laughs> 